evening. Uh, let's see here. Bobby, would you mind giving us a prayer this afternoon? Yes, sir. Got you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is 9-8. Uh, uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that was a promise to us. We thank you for the many blessings that you continuously continue to, pour, to pour over each and every one of us. Thank you for allowing each and every one of us to get on this call and receive this great word from a great pastor. As that you continue to watch over us and increase our learning as we learn about you, the truth about the Holy Bible. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3 tonight. <clears throat> and just to give a recap of chapter 2. In chapter 2, Paul talks about how he went up to Jerusalem uh, after he had been taught of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the gospel, the grace of God. And when he got there, he found, uh, he went up and stayed with Peter for about 15 days, and then they parted and he went away to the Gentiles and preached the gospel to them. And uh, Peter, James, and John went to the circumcision and preached the uh, good news to the Jews. But when he came back and met with them, he found that they had departed from the faith, giving heed to a seducing spirit. And the thing about the law, the law is very seducing. It's holy, it's just, it's good. But the only problem with the law is that we couldn't keep it. We cannot keep it. And Peter, while he was with Gentiles, he would, you know, act like a Gentile. He would eat non-kosher foods. He would eat with them when the law states that Gentiles were unclean and that Hebrews or Jews should not eat with Gentiles. Therefore, after uh, James had sent uh, people down to look into how Paul's ministry was going, uh, uh, Peter was there. And he found, when Paul found that when Peter saw the people from James, that they knew that they were still keeping kosher and keeping all the laws of Moses. And it's okay for a Jew to do that, just that they acknowledge that these things add nothing to them in the sight of God. It does not make them more acceptable or more pleasing to God. Why is that? Because Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 teaches us that the law is not of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith, the Bible states, is not going to please God. So when Peter found those people coming from James, he began to withdraw himself from the Gentiles. And Paul said, I corrected him immediately before them all because he was to be blamed. What was he, what was his, why was he not blameless? Because he was not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel is that the law has nothing to do with New Testament Christianity. The law has been replaced in New Testament Christianity. Moses, the writer of the law, said that God is going to raise up from among us one from among us. And when he comes, he's going to be the Messiah. You're to hear him in all things. Okay. And when Jesus Christ came, he replaced the old letter of the law with his new covenant that he sealed with his blood. And that was to replace all the Old Testament tenets of the law. I'm trying to get on my, uh, um, what do you call this, PowerPoint presentation a way so that I could show you the difference between what was going on uh, back when Moses was alive and then what happened with the new covenant that Jesus Christ had. Here we go. I think I'm going to start sharing my screen here if I can get back over there and remember how to do this. Screen sharing. Uh, let me see. Here we go. I'm going to try to make it bigger here. <clears throat> Now, let's see. Can you guys see that? I need somebody to unmute and say yes or no. Yes, sir. Okay, great. It says the law, Moses' law has been replaced by instructions in righteousness. Now, what is the law of Moses? The law of Moses are the Ten Commandments. That's been replaced by the new covenant of grace the grace of God that brings salvation. The law killeth, it didn't bring salvation. It brought condemnation unto death. But the Bible says the law came by Moses, 
but grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. So let's go through this uh, PowerPoint presentation that talks about <clears throat> what has happened by the law. The law has been replaced by the instructions in righteousness. So when we look at the law, <clears throat> we need to understand that it is not the good news. The law brought bad news. And God, the Bible states that he found fault with the law. What was the fault that God found with the law? The fault that God found with the law is that we couldn't keep it. And the fault that God found with the law was that it found fault with us. It could not justify us before God. It could not save us before God. Uh, the law of Moses could not make us righteous before God. The law of Moses could not uh, uh, do anything for us, but make us guilty. And you ask people, why did God give us the law? Why did God give us the law? Well, if you're not a Hebrew, he did not give you the law. The Bible says that the law was only given to the nation of Israel. It was never given to Europeans. It was never given to Asians. It was never given to Hamites, black people. It was only given to Hebrews of the nation of Israel and they could not keep it. The fault that God found with the law was that the law could not make righteous. The law could not produce righteousness. Uh, so let's go through and find the information. The law has been replaced when Christ did something to it after he fulfilled it by the instructions in righteousness. The Bible states that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine reproof, correction, and what? Instructions in righteousness, that the mind of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So why did God give the law to people? Let's go and look at it. The old covenant of the law made us justified before God? No, it made us guilty before God. It made us very, very much guilty before God, because if you broke one of the laws, what does it state at the bottom of this page? Whosoever shall keep the whole law, but it offends it or breaks it in one point, he is what? He is guilty of the entire catalog of the law. So we have to look at this and say, the old covenant made us guilty before God. That doesn't, that doesn't seem right, because people, you ask people, why did God give you the law? And they'll tell you in a minute, God gave us the law to keep. You no, know, God gave us the law to kill us. <laughs> the Bible states this in James, not James, but Romans chapter 3, verse 19. The law was given that every mouth would be stopped and that the whole world would become, it states, guilty before God. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet breaks it in one point, they are what? They are guilty of the whole law. Just a moment. Let me see if I can move this over a little bit. Can't do it. Okay, the law was given that every mouth would be without alibis, in other words, stopped, and that the whole world would become guilty, not just, but guilty before God, okay? So if you were under the law, God sees you as what? Guilty. Not just of that one law, what does it state? He is guilty of, what does it say in James 2.10? 2, you are guilty of it all. I never killed anybody if you did not honor your parents and they had to give you a spanking at one time in your life, you're guilty of murder, you're guilty of adultery, but I'm a little kid. Makes no difference. You're guilty of stealing and bearing a false witness and guilty of idolatry. If you have broken the law of one point, as far as God concerned, you are guilty of all. So on judgment day, if you are found guilty of breaking one point of the law, where will you go? Where will you go if, you find, if you're found on judgment day guilty of breaking one point of the law? You go to hell because you're guilty before God, okay? And that's the problem. And the strange thing about it, Jesus Christ is talking to a lot about ministry when he says this. Many will say unto me on judgment day, Lord, Lord, have not I preached in your name? Prophesy. And that I cast out devils in your name and done many marvelous works of the law in your name. And then Jesus states, I will declare unto them, depart from me. Why? Because they're guilty of what? Not keeping the whole law. 
because they're talking about what they are doing. They're not talking about what Christ did for them and dying for their sins and rising again to satisfy the requirements of the law. They're telling people of what they are going to do for Jesus. He says, I will declare unto them, depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. Why are they cursed? They're cursed because they are under the law. And if you're under the law and break it in one point, you're guilty of it all. And where do you go? You go to hell. Notice that these are ministers. Have not I preached in your name? That's what ministers do. Have not I prophesied in your name, preached in your name? Have not I cast out devils in your name? Yeah, they had a word for you. They cast out even devils. These things are impressive. In the Bible states right above that, by their fruits, you will know them. But it's the fruit of their lips, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and their mouth is speaking of what they taught was righteousness, what they taught was right standing before God. What does righteousness mean? Right standing before God. And they're pleading their case of why they want to go to heaven. They're pleading their case of what they base their salvation on. They base their salvation on the wonderful works that they did. What does scripture state? Jesus said, and marvel not for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers, listen to what the scripture states, hear the word of the Lord. His ministers are transformed into ministers of what? Righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Pardon me, their wonderful works. Lord, Lord, did not I preach in your name? Did not I cast out devils in your name? And did not I do many wonderful works? Where's the end going to be? Their end will be according to those wonderful works. They're not talking about the wonderful works being the works of the cross and that Jesus Christ died for their sins and rose again. Those are not the works they're talking about. They're talking about their works as if those works are going to be what recommends them unto God. And that's where they are going uh, to be in trouble for. So when we talk about this on Judgment Day, Christ tells you there's going to be not a few, but many will say unto me that day. And we have a, a group that right now is taking so many people and recruiting so many people and converting so many people to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, okay, and that he came into the world but they teach that you're saved by keeping the works of the law. And that's how you go to hell. They're called Hebrew Israelites. Once you get them corrected on that point, then they're gonna be a great force and be a wonderful soul winning force of Jesus Christ in the gospel of the grace of God. And that's where we stand. The Bible says that since the law made you guilty before God, what did Jesus do to it? He got rid of it. Wait a minute. It says in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill it. For verily or truly I say unto you, not one jot or not one tittle, in other words, not one dotting of the I or crossing of the T shall pass away from the law, listen to this, until it's all fulfilled. When Jesus Christ fulfilled the righteous demands of the law, he got rid of it. And he said, he didn't come to destroy it before that. He says, don't think that I'm come to destroy the law. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he said, not one jot or till of it will pass away until all be fulfilled. Well, how did Christ fulfill the law? Well, when you and I broke the law, the law required it to be made whole. It was offended in one point. So we had knocked down all of its dominoes and it required the guilty to die. For the wages of breaking the law, which is sin, is what? Death. So in order to fulfill the law, Christ had to take our place in death to fulfill its righteous demands. Once he died for our sins, tasting death for every man, that made the law hold. He satisfied the demands of the law. The law demanded death for lawbreakers. Christ died for the lawbreakers. The scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And therefore he fulfilled the works of the law. Because the law works wrath. It doesn't work forgiveness. 
The law works wrath. You break it, you die. It makes you guilty before God. As it is written, whosoever shall keep the whole law but offends it in one point, they are guilty before God. Therefore, Jesus Christ, after having died, satisfying the righteous demands of the law, he did what? He took it out of our way, took it out of our way by nailing it to his cross. To remove our law-breaking guiltiness before God, Jesus Christ died in our place as the guilty one. He that knew no sin took upon himself the sins of the world, and the law demanded a death by the cross to kill such a cursed person. And Christ died in our place, accursed, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. And he was hanging on that tree that in our place as guilty to give us his righteousness. It's called the great exchange where Jesus Christ took away our sin and became sin for us. He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when Jesus Christ came, the Bible says in Colossians 2.14 that he came and blotting out, he blotted out the handwriting of the law's ordinances. That's the law of the Ten Commandments. Whose handwriting was it? The law was written by the finger of God. It was God's handwriting against us that was contrary to us because we couldn't keep it. Therefore, he took it out of the way by doing what to it? According to Colossians 2.14, by nailing it to his cross, Jesus Christ took the law that was holy. The commandments were just and good. These are the laws of Moses. And he did what with them? He nailed them to his cross. The name of this slide presentation is the law has been replaced by the new covenant's instructions in righteousness. The scripture states in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, that Jesus Christ abolished in his flesh the law of commandments. Hebrew Israelites don't understand this. They don't read it. Jesus Christ abolished where? In his flesh. Why? Because sin was condemned in the flesh. When Jesus Christ was upon the cross, Melchizedek came like the Old Testament priest of old and laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's how the Old Testament high priest laid the sin of the nation of Israel upon the sheep on the day of atonement. And then that sheep's blood was shed. And the Christ, the Bible says, when Jesus Christ came into the world, John the Baptist saw him. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he was upon that cross, all the sins of the world were confessed upon him. And he was slain in our place. And that's why the Bible says that he that knew no sin became sin for us in the flesh. And Jesus abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in ordinances to do what? To reconcile Jew and Gentile to God, having slain the enmity thereof. The enmity. What was the enmity? The enmity of the law thereby. So Christ slain the law. Christ abolished the law. After he fulfilled it, then he took it out of our way. Why? Because Romans 4.15 states, where there is no law, there is no what? Transgression. And where there is no transgression, there is no sin. For sin is the breaking of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Therefore, Christ took the law out of our way so that we would not be guilty. Galatians, not Galatians, Romans chapter 3, verse 19 states that the law was given that every mouth would be stopped, means without alibi, and that the whole world would become guilty before God. Christ took our guilt and our shame and our sin in his own body, bored on the tree. And the Bible says that God laid upon him the iniquity of us all and gave us his righteousness. And when did he do with it? He nailed it to the cross. Colossians 2, 14. Romans 7, 8. Why does Romans 7, 8 state? Because without the law, sin is what? Sin is dead. And sin has been dead, nailed to the cross, where Jesus Christ became sin for the last 2,000 years. But is that the good news the church is preaching? No. The church is preaching sin is alive and well, because they walk by sight and not by faith that comes by hearing the word of the Lord. Okay? 
Why was the law that was holy and the commandment that was just and the commandment was good a problem for us? Because the law was against us. Why was it against us? Because once you committed a act against it and broke it in one of its tenets, you were considered guilty of the whole catalog. And there were not just 10 commandments, there were 613. That's why the Bible says in Colossians or Ephesians 2, 15, the law was against you because you couldn't keep it. And it was contrary to you, okay? The law makes humanity guilty before God. The law is called the administration of death. The letter of the law kills. The law is called the administration or administration of condemnation. The law doesn't justify you in the sight of the Lord. The Bible says by the law, no flesh living shall be justified in God's sight. It is evident for the just shall live by faith and the law kills. The law cannot be kept by human flesh. Now one human has kept one of the 10 commandments. People say all the time, I've never killed anybody. Jesus Christ said, uh, I, the, instead of old, that thou shall not kill. But I say unto you that if you've ever hated someone, you are guilty of murder. That means you broke the law. You know what? The Romans, no, Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 says, the law is the power of sin. The strength of sin is the law. Galatians chapter 3. Oh, Hebrews chapter 9 states, the law makes nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better covenant is. Galatians 3, 12 states, the law is not of faith. So if you kept it, you did not please God. The scripture states in Galatians 3, the law is a curse for those who cannot keep it. Therefore, the law was our schoolmaster, Galatians chapter 3, what we're going to be covering tonight, to bring us to Christ. But you know what? This is a schoolmaster that kills its student. We might be justified by grace and by faith. That's why it brings us to Christ so we can be raised from the dead. The law imputes or charges sins to its violator. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified from the works of the law by the hearing of faith. Jesus Christ crucified the curse of the law, and Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ blotted out the law with his own blood, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. But people won't believe it. Jesus said, and people tell you all the time, I thought Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. For truly I say unto you, not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law until, do you see that? Until, you need to write, spell that out yourself. Till, T-I-L-L, -L, all of it is fulfilled. And after he fulfilled every one of it, every jot, every tittle of its 1613 ordinances, he fulfilled it, he then nailed it to his cross. That's why we say it's paid in full. The debt we owe to the law was paid in full. Jesus Christ drove stakes through it, nailing it to his cross, okay? The law was fulfilled and nullified at the cross over 2,000 years ago. In the Bible states, where there is no law, sin is dead. That's why we can go to heaven, because what? Sin is dead. You know why Jews don't fear Hitler? Because Hitler's dead. You know why we don't fear the curse of the law that separated us from God as guilty and made us condemned because it was called the ministry of condemnation, whereas the new covenant is called the ministration of righteousness because the law has been taken out of our way, crucified with cross, crucified with Christ on the cross. Therefore, we state, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ, who is our life, liveth in me. In the life who is our, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Hebrew Israelites are frustrating the grace of God. For if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ 
is dead, not died. He's dead because he lied. He is dead in vain, but he's not dead. He says, I am he that living and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Now, those who are under the law, they are dead. And the Bible states that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Okay. So the scripture states in Romans 7, 6, and Hebrew Israelites need to understand this. Now we are delivered from the what? The law. Why? Because the law has been replaced by what? The instructions in righteousness. The law has been in place, replaced by the instructions in righteousness that were given to the that were given to Paul as the commandments of the Lord. Now the scripture states, Jesus said, if you love me, he didn't say you'll keep Moses' law. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But the problem with Christianity and the problem with Christians and the problem with the church is that its church pastors, its church teachers are ignorant of the commandments of the Lord. You can ask any pastor in any city, uh, tell me where I can find the commandments of the Lord. And they will have a blank look on you and say, uh, Jesus said a new commandment I give unto you that you uh, love one another as I have loved you. Uh, love is uh, the new commandment that God gave us. Okay, that's one of them. But he said, you will keep my commandments. I see that S on there. That means plural, okay? Where are the commandments of the Lord? Well, those are the laws of Moses. No, those have been taken out of the way, nailed to his cross. What are the commandments of the Lord? The commandments of the Lord are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 37, and you need to turn over there if you have a Bible and read that and highlight that and put a bookmarker in that page so that you will not be deceived and go back under the law. The scripture says that now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. Why? We were delivered from the law by Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the son shall make you free from the law of Moses, ye shall be freed indeed. He told you now you're free from the law to do what you want to? No, to obey the commandments of the Lord. Where are those commandments? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 37 states, Paul writes that whosoever of you is a prophet or a pastor, one who proclaims, a proclaimer of the word of God. The Bible says, who is a prophet? But those who testify uh, the spirit of Jesus Christ, and they have the spirit of prophecy. When you're testifying of Jesus Christ, whosoever is a prophet or spiritual, if you think you're spiritual, then you must do this. Let that person acknowledge that the things that I, the apostle Paul, write are what? The commandments of the Lord. So now you have it over 95%, 98% of the pastors in this nation and throughout the world, you now know where the commandments of the Lord are. They were written by the Apostle Paul, who was instructed to give them to the Gentiles. They're not the laws of Moses. His writings are the commandments of the Lord. His writings are scripture, according to Peter, who said, our beloved brother Paul <clears throat> wrote according to the wisdom given to him of God, he wrote things that are hard to be understood that those who are unlearned and unstable in these scriptures do wrestle them as they also wrestle the other scriptures to their own what? Destruction. If you're under the law, after Christ delivered you from the law, you make yourself a sinner. Galatians 5, 4 states, that Jesus Christ is become of no profit to you, whosoever you are who are justified by the works of the law, you have fallen from grace and price. Christ profits you nothing. I'm going to say it again, Galatians 5, 4, whosoever of you who are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace and Christ Prophets, you nothing.
not salvation, not righteousness, not redemption, not sanctification, not salvation. Christ profits you nothing. Whosoever of you who are not delivered from the law, you have fallen from grace. In Titus 2.10 states, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men that <clears throat> we should be denying ungodliness and worldly lusts should be learning this doctrine, the gospel of the grace of God, how to live soberly, righteously in this present world, looking for the, the, the blessed hope. But now we are delivered from the curse of the law, okay? That being dead by the cross, where we, we were crucified with Christ, that wherein we were held, okay? Christ delivered us from the law and gave us a new covenant. The old covenant was the letter of the law that killed us. The new covenant is the administration of life and righteousness. That's why Paul wrote, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law, <clears throat> for Jesus Christ gave us the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to deliver us from this law of sin and death. If you broke this law, you were guilty of sin and the wages of sin is death. The law works wrath. What is the wrath of the law? Death on anyone who does not keep it in its entirety. Therefore, Christ had to step in your place and my place and taste death for every man, woman, born, boy, and girl that was ever born from Adam all the way to the last person born. And he took away the sin of the world by the sacrifice of himself. He was delivered for our offenses. What were our offenses against? The law of Moses. And after he delivered us from the law, he gave us the new covenant of grace. Okay, Jesus Christ satisfied and then crucified the law, doing what to it? Nailing it to his cross, okay? So what I'm hearing, I have a license to sin. That's what the first thing people tell you. No, people think that people, Christians will run amok since there is no law. No, God replaced the law with something better. The Bible says God found fault with the law, so he gave us a new covenant with better promises. The old covenant only had one promise. Children, if you obey your parents, uh, you'll, you'll live long upon the earth. That's all. The new covenant had better promises than that. Will it keep Christians from misbehaving? Absolutely, the new covenant will. Let's see what it states. Christ replaced the law with the new covenant's instructions in righteousness. What's that? What's that? The new covenant instructions in righteousness is the word of God written by the apostle Paul. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and what? Instructions in righteousness. The law gave you instructions how not to sin, but if you did not sin, that did not put you in righteousness because the law could not make you righteous. It could not give you a right standing before God. Why? Because Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 states, the law is not of faith, and without faith it is what? Impossible to please God. Therefore, God gave us, through Jesus Christ, new covenant, a new covenant instructions in righteousness. What's that? Well, it's the righteousness of faith. You have to lay down the law to follow the instructions in righteousness. The Bible states in Proverbs, take fast hold of instruction, let it not go. Keep it for it is thy life, okay? Now the instructions in righteousness, Jesus Christ teaches believers to do what? Un deny ungodliness, also to deny worldly lust. The grace of God teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world, okay? That's what it states. This is what the instructions in righteousness teaches us to do under the new covenant, okay? The law has been replaced by the instructions in righteousness. Let's see how this works. The law states, thou shalt not steal. The new covenant instructions in righteousness state, in replacing the law of thou shalt not steal, let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor, which is good that he may have to give to him that needs, Ephesians 4, 28, okay? That's how the law was replaced by the new covenant instructions in righteousness. Let's take another one. 
the law, which is null and void, being nailed to Christ's cross, states, thou shalt not kill. The new covenant's instructions in righteousness state, let none of you, born again Christians, suffer as a murderer or as a thief, thou shalt not steal, or as a busybody in other men's matters. These are our instructions in righteousness, instructions in right living before the Lord, okay? The law, which is null and void, being nailed to the cross of Christ, states, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The instructions in righteousness states, wherefore, putting away lying, let every man speak truth to his neighbor. Not bear false witness, but speak truth to his neighbor, and his word is truth. The instructions in righteousness tells little children, keep thyself from idols, whereas the law says, thou shall have no other gods before me, neither any graven image, okay, that you bow down yourself to it. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of their children on the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. The new covenant's instructions in righteousness says, little children, keep thyself from idols, okay? The law, which is null and void, being nailed to the cross of Christ, crucified, abolished, says thou shalt not commit adultery, whereas the instructions in righteousness state to avoid sexual immorality or to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 and 3. The law of Moses states, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord shall not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. The new covenant replaces that instruction in righteousness stating, let no communication, let no corrupt communication, pardon me, let no corrupt communication come out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the edifying of the hearer, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you have been sealed until the day of redemption. The law, which has been nailed to the cross, nullified, abolished in the flesh of Jesus Christ, states, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And nobody has ever, even the Hebrew Israelites, they still, they stick on this one saying remember the sabbath day to keep it holy and the problem is is that when you go back and look at the sabbath day when does the sabbath begin the sabbath begins the evening and the morning are the day christ said are not there 12 hours in the day we say 24 that's day and night in hebrew scripture jesus says are not there 12 hours in the day and from the beginning the evening which begins at 6 p.m. and ends at 11.59 p.m. And the morning, which begins at midnight and ends six hours later at 6 a.m., were the day, okay? We're sleeping during that time, so we're not keeping it holy sleeping. We need to be up fasting and praying and keeping the Sabbath holy. But we call night day and day night. Therefore, the law states, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, since we violated that by sleeping on it sleeping during those times, uh, the scripture states that the instructions and writings tell us, let no man judge you in meat or drink, kosher, or in respect to a holy day, or in what? Sabbath days. Now, Paul wrote that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. And if you love Jesus, Jesus said that you'll keep the commandments of the Lord, which are his commandments, which were written by the apostle Paul. But yet the Hebrew Israelites are saying, no, you forget Paul's writings. And you go back to the law of Moses, which makes you guilty. Okay? That's the problem. Jesus said in the last days before his coming, many will come in my name saying, yes, Jesus is the Christ. And they shall deceive many by teaching that you make Christ Lord of your life by keeping the laws of Moses. No, the law of Moses made you guilty before God. The law of Moses is called the strength of sin. The law of Moses is called the administration of condemnation. It could not make you righteous before the Lord. So the Bible says he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And he gave us Paul who said, if any man thinks himself to be a pastor or a prophet or spiritual, then let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments 
of the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep these commandments that were written by the apostle Paul according to the new covenant's instructions in righteousness, which says, let no man judge you in respect to your kosher eating or drinking or respect to a holy day or respect to Sabbath days, which are a foreshadow of things to come. People say, oh, Christianity celebrates on the 25th, a holy day. That's a, that's a, the, the pagan holiday. What did Paul say? Don't let people judge you in regard to that. He says, if you regard that day, you regard it unto the Lord. If you regard not that day to the Lord, you regard it not. Men are not to judge you in these things. God is not judging me in these things. God judged Jesus in taking him to the cross to take these things out of our way. These things, he says, are going to be taken up in the ages to come, where he's going to give us a new Sabbath to keep. Okay. Therefore, again, the law of Moses states to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., Instructions in righteousness state, let no man judge you in meat or drink or respect to a holy day or Sabbath days, which are a foreshadow of things to come in the ages to come. The law of Moses states, honor thy father and thy mother. The instructions in righteousness of the new covenant states, honor thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee. Ephesians chapter six, verses two, through three. So do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. We establish the law right where the word of God puts it, crucified with Christ, nailed to his cross according to Colossians 2.14, and fulfilled by Jesus Christ, and abolished according to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15. So do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. God has forbidden that possibility to be. We establish the law right where the word of God puts it, crucified with Christ, abolished in his flesh, taken out of our way because it was against us and contrary to us because we couldn't keep it. Therefore, he took it out of our way, nailing it to his cross. And that's where we establish the law. As fulfilled by Jesus Christ, who said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, for not one jot or till of it shall pass away until it is fulfilled. And when he fulfilled it, he did what with it? He took it out of our way, nailing it to his cross, abolished and slain in his flesh. The law was replaced because your penalty for violating one law resulted in your death, eternal death, eternal separation from God. Therefore, God provided you a new covenant with better promises. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son, not the law of Moses, he who has the son has life. He that has not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. Whereas God gave us the instructions in righteousness, <clears throat> to replace the law that he took out of the way, nailing it to this cross, abolishing it. Whereas when you, uh, when you were under the law and broke the law, you were considered guilty and worthy of death, eternal separation from God. Whereas violating an instruction in righteousness does not carry the death penalty always. Violating God's instructions in righteousness will result in a believer's chastisement in one of four categories. When you violate Paul's instructions in righteousness, which replace Moses' law as the commandments of the Lord, it's called a fault. It's called a wrong. It's called an offense. And it's called an error. Okay? When you do these things and break the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, then Jesus Christ will have ought against you. But it does not result in the termination and the termination of a believer's free gift of eternal life. Okay. A fault. A fault is a penalty where the believer will be buffeted for their own faults, as it states in 1 Peter 2:20. If you be buffeted for your own fault and you take it patiently, what profit is it? Okay. Now, if you're buffeted for your own faults of disobeying one of the Lord's commandments as written by the Apostle Paul per 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 37. It says the remedy for this is if 
a man be overtaken in a fault? Ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest you also be tempted. Galatians 6, 1. The Bible tells us, because you're not going to keep the commandments of the Lord perfectly all the time, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be what? Healed. Second thing, those who violate the commandments of the Lord as written by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14.37, I think it is, it states, the penalty for that, he that doeth wrong, whether you're going to be a believer, shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And for this cause, the scripture states, for this cause, many are weak and sickly, and some have even died or sleep because they have not discerned the Lord's body. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we're to know how to possess our vessels uh, holily and justly and righteously. Not that that makes us holy, just, and righteous. That was done by the sacrifice of Christ that perfected us forever in the sight of God. But if we begin to live wrong, we shall receive for the wrong which we have done. The scripture states, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap up to and including death. The remedy is trust in the Lord and do what? Good, not do wrong. Trust in the Lord and do good. The scripture states, give an example, defraud ye not a brother, for the Lord is the avenger of all such. And, and one guy, he was in the church of God, sleeping with his father's wife. In the scripture, by the apostle Paul, commandments of the Lord says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, okay? So, or to teach them not to blaspheme. That person, they delivered him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, and he repented and came back. And the Bible said when he came back in 2 Corinthians, it said, receive such a one so he wouldn't be overtaken with much sorrow because he did repent. Okay, but this is one of the things that the church can exercise on believers who are running amok among the congregation. They can deliver such a one for Satan so they can go to be with the Lord because there's no benefit to the body of Christ. Third thing, if you start violating the commandments of the Lord, it's called an offense. The scripture states, offenses shall come, but woe to that man by whom that offense comes. The scripture tells us the remedy by this destruction and righteousness. Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Give no offense to Jews, Gentiles, or your conscience or to the church of God. Remember Ananias and Sapphira, they gave offense to the Holy Ghost. They said they sold their piece of property for this so they can get glory among men in the church where God is the God of all glory. And they, Peter said, uh, did you sell this land for this much? Yes, we did. And we gave it all to the church. He said, why is it? Why has Satan provoked you to lie to the Holy Ghost? And they were carried out. And these were born-again believers, okay? So you can, there is, there is death penalties in this, okay? There are sins unto death, errors for those who violate the commandments of the Lord as written by the Apostle Paul per 1 Corinthians 14, 37 to receive in oneself the recompense of their error, which was meat, okay? Do not err, my beloved brethren. If any brother err from the truth and one convert him, okay? Do not err, err, err. You do err not knowing the scripture nor the power of God. The Hebrew Israelites teach error by saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, Jesus Christ died for your sins, and the way you make him Lord of your life is by obeying Moses' law, which he nailed to the cross. That's an error. And we who are spiritual are to recover them from that error by giving them the new covenants, instructions, and righteousness, which are made on better promises. Warning. Believers in Christ are not to use their liberty in Christ. Whom the Son has made free is free indeed, but not free to do as you wish. You're free to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. It's not free for you to let your flesh run amok. For them, Jesus Christ loves them. Jesus Christ loves you. And the Bible says, he says, who I love, I rebuke and chasten. Okay? Be not deceived. You're now the child of God. 
When you have a child that acts a fool, what do you do? You rebuke and you chasten that person, okay? Same with the Lord. Jesus says, whoever I love, I rebuke and I chasten. And he does it with his word first. And if you won't listen to the word, then he starts bringing adverse circumstances in your life. You can see that upon America. We have weather misbehaving. The Bible states when that occurs, that is a judgment from the Lord. Okay, read the book of Job. Those are judgments from the Lord. Okay, let's go further. The gold God has set for every Christian is love. Now, the end of the commandment, the commandments of the Lord, is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. The goal of God is set for every Christian is not only love, but that Christ, who is the love of God, be made manifest in our mortal bodies. Okay? And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep Moses' commandments? No. Moses said, if you believe, Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, who wrote the Ten Commandments, you would have believed me, because Moses was writing about me when he said, God is going to raise up one from among the Hebrew brethren that you are to hear in all things, because he will be the Messiah. In all things means you're to forsake me and go with him. He has a new covenant with better promises. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37 states, Paul says, if any person thinks himself to be spiritual or a proclaimer, a prophet, then let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are what? The commandments of the Lord. Not these, but the things that Paul write are the commandments of the Lord. And he wrote the New Covenant's instructions in righteousness. Let's read it together. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, stating, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, Hebrew Israelites think they're spiritual, but they will not acknowledge this, so they're carnal. They go after the law of Moses, which is the law of a carnal commandment, okay? If any man thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, then let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, let's say it together, are the commandments of the Lord, okay? These are the commandments of the Lord that Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. The commandments of the Lord were written by the Apostle Paul, okay? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. These instructions in righteousness, the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. You need to circle that and have that bookmarked in your Bibles. Now, we have a free book online for you. If you're new to the faith and want to learn more, I've written, I made that PowerPoint presentation. And I've also wrote a free book online called 100 Reasons Why Born Again Believers Cannot Lose Their Salvation. Okay, what Martin Luther failed to show you, Martin Luther was the champion of the Protestant Reformation. What, do, what, what does Protestant means? Protestant, the root word of Protestant, it means protest. What was he protesting? He was protesting the Roman Catholic Church Eurocentric Christianity, okay? And how that they had priest that would come into the city and say, nobody's getting their sins forgiven until I say so. Uh, God has given no man that ability, okay? But this is the new covenant. You have got to go to the new covenant to understand what's going on in these instructions in righteousness. Now, I'm going to leave some time today to, uh, uh, what are you going to do? Leave some time today to ask questions. You can unmute your phone and we can go over some questions. I'm sure a lot of people may have questions to ask. So feel free to do so at this time. Or if anyone has anything to add or correct, I may have said something wrong, <clears throat> please feel free at this time. Can I just share a scripture? Sure. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved by God, 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You care to elaborate? Well, I think that speaks to everything that you've been saying, that we should be very um, engaged in what God wants us to do and has demonstrated through Paul. Exactly, exactly. I remember when uh, I was going to uh, Bible study with your husband when we were in college, and this person that had this Bible study, she was blowing us away with the... Uh, revelation of the grace of God, the revelation of the types and shadows of scripture. She called them correspondences. Her name was Patty Holt. And then uh, our friend Velvey said, uh, why doesn't this person who you study under quote the apostle Paul, his name was Emmanuel Swedenborg. So why didn't Swedenborg quote the apostle Paul? And she said, well, I believe when the student is ready, the teacher will appear and I'm that teacher. And the Apostle Paul, according to Emmanuel Swedenborg, was not an apostle of Jesus Christ. And that just sent me, I'd learned so much from this Bible study, that just sent me into a tailspin. And when it sent me into that tailspin, I went to the scriptures, because I know that's the scriptures of truth. And I began to write, read the Apostle Paul's writings. And when I came across this verse, I asked the Lord to show me. And when he said, well, if any man thinks himself to be spiritual and Emmanuel Swedenborg always, always said, I'm a spiritualist, I'm a spiritualist. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not acknowledge that the things that Paul wrote were the commandments of the Lord and come to find mm -hmm. out his, uh, his volumes that I flew to New York City and got all those volumes that your husband wrestled away from me and threw away uh, thousands of dollars worth, hundreds of dollars worth at that time. Uh, he called them the Arcana Celestia. Well, Arcana means arcane, dark dark mm -hmm. heavenly so he was going into the heavenlies and getting his information from fallen angels and when he wrote them down in these books we would read these books and we would do like those people the moonies that would be walking around the airports our eyes were glazed over because he would just blow our minds with all this information that he had gotten from these fallen angels but at the bottom of the page he would say something like jesus christ's blood is like the blood of the serpent so we took these books to the pastor pastor jim keegan at that time in Emporia, Kansas. And he, we gave him a hymn. I said, look at these and tell me what you think. So the next Sunday he came back and he, had, he pushed them all, all the volumes. He said, these books are very engaging and they'll suck you in and it's like a vortex. They're very intriguing and they're very uh, seducing. But let me tell you, uh, you need to get rid of these things because they're not of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are luring, they'll suck you in. They're mind blowing and they almost suck me in. But when you read that little thing at the bottom of the page, when you get to reading all these volumes, he's gonna snap, he's gonna sense that. And then it's gonna make all that you've learned from the scriptures of truth a lie. And you'll be inside of Satan's snare. And I'm not gonna let you in my pulpit anymore until you get rid of these books. So I told your husband, who was a bodybuilder, Brian, you're gonna have to wrestle these books from me, but get away, get away <laughs> from me and and he was happy to do it. <laughs> he told me. He told me. He told him. Just take them away. Take them away, Brian. Boy, and I tried. To, I looked in every trash dumpster to get them back out. And I'm still, oh, no. I'm still scared to go. go. Those things is very seducing. It's very alluring. He goes and talks to you about. He was uh, Emmanuel Swedenborg was alive back in the 1700s, and he knew all the known knowledge of the world, all botany. So when you look in the books of the Bible, it talks about a a uh, uh, palm tree, a sycamore tree, and this, he would tell you the reason why he says palm tree here is because these are the characteristics. And he'd be bringing all these things together scientifically. And it just mm -hmm. be mind blowing of what he's saying. You know, palm tree, oak tree, where it says about oak tree instruction, he started talking about wisdom and truth and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing, but he was going to lead you away from the doctrine of the grace of God because he was not spiritual. He was carnal and marvel not for Satan himself has ministers that have transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness who teaches you righteousness by the works of the law instead of by the hearing of faith. So this is the prelude of us going into Galatians chapter three next week. Okay. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. Does anyone else have any 
more additions <clears throat> to the Bible study? You want to add anything? Or have any questions? Pray for this group called the Hebrew Israelites because they are very zealous, but they have a zeal that's very good. They know a lot of scriptures and they bring out a lot of good truths, but the crux of it is that they're teaching that the laws of Moses is how you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And they're unaware of the new covenants, that little bitty verse tucked away in the uh, 14th chapter of Corinthians that state that the commandments of the Lord, according to the new covenant, have been written by Paul in that Jesus Christ has taken the old covenant, <clears throat> the old letter, the old letter of the old covenant that killeth out of our way, nailing it to his cross, abolishing that as enmity in his flesh, and that was contrary to us. So pray that God drops the blinders from their eyes. Like Paul said, I was uh, the law deceived me and by it slew me. For I thought I was a law alive by keeping the commandments. But when the commandment came, sin revives. For where there is no law, there, sin is dead. When you bring the commandment, sin revives and you die. Okay? Not that you lose your salvation, but you go under a law and you cannot be productive for the kingdom in that when the works of the law for the law of of faith galatians <clears throat> 217 or 317.1 well will they go davis on tonight please yes. and uh, let us know about your prayer service okay y'all uh, today um for every monday through friday um at uh, 9 30 which would be 8 30 you guys time I have prayer service on online. Uh, you can reach me at Dago Davis um, on there, and um, I'll be happy um, to um, accept your friend request, and we'll go from there. I want to say thank you again, Brother James, um, for really just, um, I'm telling you, I, people are asking me, and it was like, I was like, um, I have a friend, I used to stay in Texas and all that. It was like, man, um, how I'm going to get on, and I was just telling them, but um, I'm waiting on, I sent them the uh, um, the thing that Bob showed me, okay. and was waiting on them to come aboard. Uh, I have been talking to them uh, on my thing and enlightening them, so we'll be getting some more people to come in. So thank you again. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'll, I'll say I enjoy it, I love it, and I'm going to stay with it. Praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, Dago Davis is found on Facebook at uh, DagoDavis.com. Uh, Dago, Dago Davis, D-A-Y-G-O Davis. And if you go there, he's in a uh, sharp uh, golden suit. You can send him a friend request and he'll uh, let you in. You can go in there and pray with him and listen to him pray uh, each day from uh, 8.30 our time till I think about 9 o'clock, about 30 minutes. Yes. Refreshing. So. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you, Father, to take this word and seal it throughout this nation, particularly in the Hebrew Israelites, so that their eyes may be enlightened to your commandments, for the commandments of the Lord are right and makes wise the uh, servants of the Lord, and it uh, justifies us before you by telling us to believe in Jesus and gives us these precious promises, and when this is a promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. Father, we thank you that you've given us your blood to justify us before God, given us your grace to justify us for, for God and for delivering us from the curse of the law. For by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in your sight. Father, we thank you for this. We ask you to just cause us to be a witness for you and be able to stand and be able to defend, stand in defense of the gospel against those who would assail it to try to replace the commandments of the Lord with the carnal commandments of Moses' law. This we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Have a great night. Amen. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.